a lot of questions. Have you noticed that how much <laughs> how many questions you have during the evening? These are the questions you see that people will ever. So I want to be respectful of time and make sure Maria has time to get through all of the material she wants to cover. So write your questions down. Why? Oh, you're out of here! <laughs> one too many. Just one too many. So write your questions down. Use that journal to write your questions down and let's get to those at the end of the class. If they're relevant and, you know, important, of course. But if right they're over, relevant. If they're relevant, <laughs> that's why. So write them down, okay? So we want to make sure that we've got enough time to get through all of this. Uh, any other announcements from for the good of the order before we get started? Yes? Edina City Hall, Friday night, has the movie at 7 o'clock. Um, More Than Honey, about bee and colony collapse. I mean, it's free. And if you can't see it then, it's in Stillwater and two, well, tell me, it's uh, the end of the month. Stillwater for free on a Saturday. Good. Other announcements, things you want to share before we get started? Snacks over here? Name tags? Name tags are always faithful. Any other announcements for you today? All right. Um, it's all yours. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you all. Um, I'm happy to be here and to talk about environmental decision making and behavior change, which hopefully will help um, inform some of your efforts as master or stewards. Um, this is what we're going to do today, or this evening. First, I want to talk about some background. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of environmental issues and then environmental message framing. So, <laughs> so, with the nature of environmental issues, we're talking about the content. Like, what are we talking about? Um, in your case, water quality. With environmental message framing, we're talking about how we communicate um, with other people about environmental issues, water quality, and how do we motivate change? Uh, change in individual behavior or change in policy? So, how do we frame messages to? to inspire people to do something. Um, and then implications um, for behavior change based on how, based on those two things together, based on the nature of environmental issues and based on how environmental messages are often framed. And that will make sense in a second. And then I want to give you a little case study of some yard care choices research in the Twin Cities that I did when I was at the University of Minnesota as a postdoc, um, which hopefully will give you some ideas for uh, maybe projects or ways of, uh, ways people think about their lawns and yards in relation to water quality. And then finally, we're going to <coughs> apply all this through a model of behavior change, where you're going to design your own uh, little behavior change campaign. And at the end of class. I won't ask if there's any questions yet. <laughs> so to have you write them down. <laughs> but soon. So first, the nature of environmental issues. Um, what is it about environmental issues that makes them, I guess, difficult, challenging, I'll say. They're complex, and a couple ways that they're complex is that things are interconnected. So you can't really address one on its own. These systems are interconnected, so where do you start? Another one is that there are aggregate effects from individual actions, and this is something that will be um, greatly pertains to what you guys are doing with um, water quality and people's yards and things like that. So aggregate effects. Individual, one action may not really make that much of a difference, but together they make a big difference, so what do we do with that? Also, we have a lot of conflicting reports on problems and solutions. If you look in the news and this media. This is interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> do I get another one? Okay. <laughs> Gosh, it's really late in life. <laughs> Just don't step in any water. Okay. So, you can put that in there. <laughs> Sorry, we have to get this out of here. Okay. All right. So, conflicting reports on problems and solutions is another way to put complex. Also, there's a long term, there are long term, and there's a, it's often a delay in visible consequences. So, you might do something, um, but you might not know the consequence. So it's hard for individuals, especially to gauge what 
what their, what their effects are on the system. And they have cumulative effects. It's kind of a long-term um, buildup before we might even see that there's an issue or a problem. There's also, the, as I just mentioned, a distance between the action and the consequence of that action. How do we bring those things closer together? And there's usually a focus on degradation. You don't usually hear about all the benefits that people are bringing to ecosystems, unfortunately, but maybe someday we will discuss them in that way. But there's often a focus on degradation. It's human created, we're doing something wrong. Um, and we'll get more on this when we talk about environmental framing of environmental messages. So here are some examples or some characteristics, I'll say, of environmental issues that um, are important to consider. And so what I'd like you to do for a moment in your journals is to think about what examples of the, need of the nature of environmental issues here on the board do you see in what you've learned about stormwater management and water quality so far from your course? So how do you guys see these characteristics of environmental issues reflected in um, what you guys will be working on in terms of water quality and stormwater, um, I guess, management on people's and neighborhoods, things like that? Yeah, like what do you see about water quality and the issues that you'll be addressing that, um, I mean, do you see these characteristics of environmental issues in what you've been learning about? Do you see that they are interconnected, and in, if so, in what way? Do you see aggregate effects, if so, in what way? So just try to bring these, uh, connect these with what you guys are doing. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay, so take a couple minutes, a minute or two, and write down some ideas. Not yet, <laughs> but in a second. Some individual reflection first, and then... So what are some of your thoughts about this, how, what you do, you see, how you see these characteristics and what you've been learning about? Yes. The storm system is unpredictable, so mm -hmm. even though it's storm that I'm focusing on is possible for it to be in storm, and it's not, it's, um, Mm -hmm. Right. So how could a property that's so far away possibly affect? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Should I keep trying to talk or just wait? <laughs> Can you guys hear me? <laughs>
Okay, okay. So, so exactly. We might, properties might not be close to our water body, but that doesn't mean that they're not affecting that water yeah. body. Okay, it could be four blocks away. It could be pretty close. It could be pretty close, and there still might not be the idea that it af it affects it. Great. Yeah, that's a great example. Yes. Um, the idea that we're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. and just somebody coming to my house and telling me mm -hmm. that I'm doing things wrong, and, mm -hmm. and quote being bad. Yeah. To themselves or to the world, as you know, something you're putting on your lawn or your your oh, magazine, yeah. your mm -hmm. downspout is great. Mm -hmm. People generally don't like to be approached with with a negative. Right. Exactly. Well, I think, um, and I was kind of thinking about down spouts and, mm -hmm. and streets or alleys or whatever. Um, people, I think, have a sense that there are some possibilities of short term harm if they mm -hmm. let the water get too close to their house because they, they see it's going to flood. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they will see and feel that right away if mm -hmm. it happens. Right. Um, whereas, we might be asking them to do to let it infiltrate um, uh, and not go in their storm drains. That's there's no visible mm -hmm. um, consequence of that. Right. <coughs> Tangible. Right. Great. What else? A couple more. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, aggregate effects of that exact thing. Mm -hmm. Mine's just one downspout mm -hmm. on the whole. I mean, just one downspout. That's not going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. But if you go from house to house to house and you know, mm -hmm. the person's your fence is. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Really, one downspout is not going to make a difference. Right, right, great. Okay, a couple more. Yeah. I think the diffusion of causes is really difficult because there's confusion mm -hmm. over what's causing things. Mm -hmm. Is it rainfall? Is it so if it's really salt, that means it's just getting salt. If it's fertilizer, it's not mm -hmm. really doing anything. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people don't realize that you know they could be um, grass or other issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and we'll get to that <laughs> question of whether people are aware of the grass and leaf issue in a second, too, with the yard care choices <laughs> research. So that's a really good point. Um, other w a couple more. One more. One more idea. Anyone? Yeah. Um, focus on degradation. <laughs> if mm -hmm. you see somebody actually dumping, say, lawn clippings mm -hmm. or leaves um, across the street into one sex, overhanging a creek, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to say you're bad, um, right. right, and that's a great um, segue into the next. So keep this in mind, keep the nature of environmental issues in mind as it relates to what you all are working on in terms of water quality and stormwater management and neighborhoods. And the next uh, part of that is how we frame environmental messages. How do we communicate? A couple of you have brought this up. How do we communicate um, about environmental issues? to people. Um, so when we talk about message framing, it encompasses uh, several different things, including what the message emphasizes, the kind of the values and meanings that it brings out, um, also the definitions of the problems and the types of solutions the message is talking about, as well as sort of uh, languages, language and images used to convey the message. And all of that together is trying, the message is trying to help the audience, the viewer of the message, interpret the situation in some way. So there can be different uh, types of framing of environmental messages, um, and they can have different, they may evoke different reactions in people. So that's, that's the next thing we're going to talk about. What reactions do uh, different framings of environmental messages evoke in people, and how can we have uh, the message is framed in a way that evokes a positive reaction <laughs> instead of the idea that, oh, I'm just doing something bad. Like, what am I going to do? Okay. So I'm gonna, I have a couple examples of some, um, and this is the article. Did you guys get a chance to look at the article? So this is based on the article that you all read for today. Um, I have a couple messages here for you to look at. These are mostly images with a little bit of text. Uh, so I'm just going to go through these slowly, give you a chance to look at them, and just think about how the message is being framed. Um, if you can't read it, let me know. And I can. So this says global warming is. Um, what's yeah. Text on the box? Oh yeah, I can't read the text on the box. <laughs> I can't help. And where's the message from in the comments? Um. 
eco education or eco yeah it looks like it's now I can't even read it um, part of the climate change convention of the United Nations yeah okay here's another one it says the greatest wonder of the sea is that it's still alive and I cannot read all of that small text either <laughs> But just to get the broad message here, this is, um, it says, when you leave the light on, <laughs> why can't, I can't read this, you're, not, you're not the only one who pays, right? You can see the images of the ice melting and polar bears and penguins on small floating pieces of ice. And then this one says the world needs more trees and it has uh, pictures, uh, koala bears, all climbing the same tree. <laughs> yeah. So how do these messages, what kind of reactions are you getting when you see these messages? Or what are you feeling? Emotion. Depressed? Emotion? Yeah, it's kind of these people are feeling. Guilt? Yeah. There's a little bit of humor, yeah. There's humor with guilt. Yeah, humor with guilt. <laughs> Global scale, so the kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopeless, yeah. They're not necessarily telling you what you can do about it. They're just telling you that what the problem is. Yeah, the history of China is on all of us with the guilt that I feel. Mm -hmm. Well, they want you to turn the light off, right? So oh, yeah. They do tell you that you can do that. Okay, that's far from, <laughs> far from what you experience, right? So the article talked about the way that environmental messages are often framed. And this, these messages are an example of how environmental messages are often framed. So I'm going to go through some of the, the arguments of the article combined with some other uh, related information. So the article argues that environmental messages are often framed in terms of altruism or this idea of self-transcendence. And altruism is feeling or acting on behalf of the welfare of others in cases where self-interest could not be involved. And the article talks more about framing environmental messages in terms of self-transcendence. The article argues that this is how they're often framed. It's in terms of goals that, quote, transcend the individual and instead promote the interests of other persons and the natural world. So, um, there are a couple assumptions that go along with this, Al and these are arguments from the article as well as related um, articles. Some assumptions that go along with this framing of environmental messages in terms of altruism or self-transcendence self is that self-interest or self-enhancing values cannot promote pro-environmental behavior. Like anything that's good for me won't be good for the environment. That could be an underlying assumption, or that could be a takeaway message that somebody might get from messages that are framed in terms of altruism or self-transcendence. Another assumption might be that altruism, and, s and this is related, altruism and self-interest cannot both be present at the same time. Like we can't do good for someone else and have a benefit for ours ourselves at the same time because a lot of environmental messages are framed only in terms of how we need to change to benefit something else or someone else or another creature which isn't necessarily bad, the article is arguing, but these framing environmental messages in terms of these only can cause a couple kinds of different kinds of reactions, especially if the person doesn't already care about the issue. If you already care about the issue, it might be very effective, but if you don't, it might cause a couple of other reactions. So more implications of this. This is from a different article, and this person argues Kaplan who is an environmental psychologist, argues that the requirement of receiving no benefit from one's action and the inclination to enshrine sacrifice as a paradigmatic environmental virtue communicate a powerful, if unintended, message, namely that environmental responsible behavior inherently leads to a reduction in quality of life. So think about that for a moment. That's not what we want <laughs> to say. 
Also, it associates pro-environmental behavior with sacrifice, and this is a related argument, and a decrease in quality of life. So environmental action is often framed in terms of giving up X in order to solve environmental problem Y. So you're giving up something in order to solve a problem. That might be necessary in some cases, but it might not be necessary in all cases. So how can we think about that as we frame environmental messages? And all of this together activates defense mechanisms. Maybe some of you felt these <laughs> when you looked at those messages. Um, denial, the problem really isn't that bad, or it doesn't really exist, it's not really happening. This idea of rational distancing, where it's not, I'm not a part of it. Apathy, I don't care. Uh, I see these things going on, there's nothing I can do about it, so I'm just gonna, I'm just not gonna care because that's the, the way that I can respond. And delegation, it's somebody else's responsibility. And I think you mentioned the idea of road salt and different issues, like whose responsibility is it really? Oh, well, it's not mine. I can't control what the city does. I can't control what my neighbor does. So none of these are my responsibility. So it could also um, cause delegation of the problem. And none of these things are very empowering. <laughs> none of these things are really helping the individual uh, be a uh, force of change. Um, also, the content of the message, and uh, some of, a couple of you mentioned, or one of you mentioned, the global nature of the messages that we just looked at. They often focus on broad problems, and they're often, all these, although the, the ones we just saw were not, they're often information intensive. Uh, just a lot of information about what's going on, but not much about what to do about it. And the implications of this are similar. It creates a sense of apath apathy and helplessness, a lack of empowerment, and that all of these are related, um, and the question, what difference can I really make? So the thing that you don't want to happen is for someone to hear an environmental message and then think, what difference can I really make? I'm not going to do anything. I can't think about this. I'm going to move on to something else. So the article, article is arguing that if we primarily um, frame environmental messages in terms of self-transcendent or these altruistic values in a society like ours where self-enhancing values are kind of part of our culture, these messages will be largely ineffective. And the author is, uh, the researchers are arguing that what we should try to do is also, not only, but also frame environmental messages in terms of how they're good for the individual. For our for our families, for our and for our communities, and then you can extend it outward to the other, uh, the kind of the altruistic values as well. Um, so, the questions that this raises are: How can we frame messages to promote these things? The realization of increased quality of life. That if we, um, that what we do doesn't just benefit someone or something else potentially far away from us, but it actually increases our own quality of life as well, in our own homes, at our, in our neighborhoods. Ecological systems support what we value. How can we also frame messages to promote empowerment, that our actions can make a difference and we can create positive change nearby? So how can we shift the focus from uh, sacrifice from this isn't really affecting me but I should do this for the good of someone else to this is something that is directly part of my life this can enhance my life uh, my actions can make a difference at the same time this also makes the world I'll say a better uh, altruistic argument a better place for everyone and everything and then you extend outwards from there um, do you guys have any questions or thoughts about this no questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think one thing that can be empowering is mm -hmm. um, we're tapping into an us against them philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like to badmouth big industry and things like that, and just realizing sometimes what they're trying to sell us in convenience and whatnot is not really an advantage. It has a lot of harmful effects, but yet we bought into the marketing. Mm -hmm. of your house can be spotless and cleaned if you buy this, but where grandma was really right in just using vinegar and water, mm -hmm. things like that. So I think maybe again, you know, uh, framing things in simplicity. Simplicity is good. Mm -hmm. um, it saves you money. 
mm -hmm. better for the environment and those types mm -hmm. of things. So you're right, there's personal gain, but then mm -hmm. there's greater good. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you, have any of you heard of the organization called A Center for a New American Dream? So that's, that would kind of, uh, who has heard of it? Can you say a little bit about it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what, what this is, is it's, it's a kind of that idea of, um, you know, looking at quality instead of quantity. You know, less is more, or the quality of our lives is more, is more important than the quantity of things that we're getting. So it's kind of a critique of consumerism and things like that. But it's all framed in, the term, in terms of, uh, you know, the American dream, this cultural value. But it's kind of reframing it a little bit to both try to promote... Um, I'll just say environmentally friendly behavior at the same time as enhancing yourself and your community. So that's a good example, I think of, and that might your comment made me think of that. A good example of um, how we can do both at the same time. That organization, you might check it out. It's pretty. It's pretty interesting. A center for a new American dream. Is that a website? Yeah, it's a website and an organization. They have a lot of resources on their page too for different things. We struggle with this. Mm -hmm. time trying to figure out how to get people involved in programs like mm -hmm. this. I mean, how do we talk yeah. about this program in a positive way mm -hmm. without causing that backlash? Yeah. It's really tricky. It's, it's hard because there is something going on that's not great, which is why we need to do something. <laughs> but how do we engage with it in a way that's empowering and promotes you know, this feeling of I can do something and it's going to enhance my life and my community? So that is your challenge <laughs> as you go out to the neighborhood and our neighborhood leaders and um, working on your projects that promote water quality and things like that. Well, it's no different than being an early adopter. Yeah. You know, that was sometimes the critique mm -hmm. of early adopter mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, did you guys bring in a media article that you found about an environmental issue? If you did, or you, so if you did, take a few minutes to look over that and think about how you might reframe its message in terms of what we just talked about. Do you find that it is doing some of the things that might cause apathy, delegation, um, lack of empowerment, things like that? And if so, how would you reframe it? If you didn't bring in a me media article, then just think about some messages you've, messages you've heard, um, environmental messages that you might reframe. So we're going to come back together as a group here. And I would love it if some of your uh, conversations that you've been having with each other, if you can share some of the ways that you have been thinking about reframing messages. Who would like to share something? Yes, please. I found an article scientists have actually tried to reframe an argument. Okay. It's on um, climate change, and it is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It involves 120,000 scientists, and what they're saying is it's a very complex problem, and it's hard to get your hands around, mm -hmm. but you don't have to be 100% certain of what's going on to know that you need to act. And the example they're using is that if you drive a car, you probably have insurance. You don't expect to get in an accident, mm -hmm. but you're acting in case that does happen. Okay. And so they're trying to do it in a way mm -hmm. that's simpler and more understandable. Great. And the analogy of acting, of insurance, it's like an individual. You get insurance on your own right. for yourself. And so that, that extends that to the individual okay. idea, too. Well, they say that 97% of all scientists, all s ecological scientists, agree that we're affecting the climate. Mm -hmm. And they're saying there really isn't any room to say that there isn't climate change. Oh, there isn't. There are people right. that are But <laughs> even if you say that, something bad's happening, so we need to take out insurance. Mm -hmm. So that's a great that's sort of the way they're going. Yeah, that's a good example of reframing the, the argument. And we, we could talk about <laughs> we'll we'll move on from the the climate change denier discussion because that could go on for a long time. So <laughs> just to focus on the topic for today, not that it's not important. Um, so what are some other ways that you saw you might reframe your article that you found? Or um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I found uh, a 
about uh, drought in California um, in, I believe it is, anyway, there's some area there, I believe it's Los Angeles, where there, there's a movement to eliminate lawns to reduce water usage, but a lot of people are really, you know, they mm -hmm. don't want to give up their lawns, and even the, um, some official, she is, she works for the water management district. She's loath to give up her, her lawn, mm -hmm. but um, she is willing to reframe it that, you know, we, you know it's less work to use mm -hmm. uh, grass in a situation like this, mm -hmm. you, know, that, you know, it can ultimately look very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it, it does Great. create resilience to uh, water stress. Great. So reframing it in a way that it's less work, it's going to benefit you, it's less work, it can be beautiful, you ha can have all the, you can have what you had with the lawn and more, <laughs> sort of. Great. That's a great example. What else? One more. How about one more? Yeah. No. Go ahead. <laughs> um, why did the study so I'm not reframing, but mm -hmm. the study that was released to the Proceedings of National Science Foundation about the issue, and then that, um, and it's only kind of the abstract. I'm putting two together that has kind of gone into print, but basically they studied lawns across, the headlines are lawns across America is U.S. becoming one third green. Mm -hmm. So you guys might have seen it, but the premise was that it's really the um, beautiful green lawn is the main lawn that everybody has and it's the kind of vascular lawn. And through the study, they kind of found that that's not true and that it will take local, it will likely be, um, lawns are not, I'm going to quote, lawns are not only From the global to the local, yeah. and to being more local mm -hmm. to what the, the um, local land is looking like. Okay, great. Yeah, did you? Well, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. The bulk turf grasses. Mm -hmm. So, like in California, there's a company called Dewgrass Seed and mm -hmm. Turf Company. I don't know if you heard that one, but <laughs> they have been doing studies for about 10 years on using the native grasses. Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. And they look like regular grass. They yeah. keep them a little bit taller, like maybe two and a half mm -hmm. inches at the shortest, but they use like 80% less water. They were saying that they tried to give them the same amount of water and they would fail. So it's because mm -hmm. we just think, oh, these are the, this is the turf that everybody wants and we put that kind of seed mm -hmm. in because that's the Kentucky bluegrass or that's the rye grass. But really, you could do this for native to mm -hmm. become your region and have it developed so that it looks like turf grass and mm -hmm. still get the same effect, but put the more fertile ones. Yeah, that's a really yeah, that's a really good point like too. Yeah. The local thing. Uh huh. You're like, okay, let's use native yeah. California grasses. We have a water problem. Like, what can we do? How can we work with the so the was, ecosystem okay. in this area to right? That's great. Yeah, actually, at the University of Minnesota, too, their turf grass science researchers are doing a similar thing, looking at low input varieties of grasses, which require much less water and fertilizer and things like that. Uh, and low mow and no mow varieties as well. So, and yeah. uh, we have a beekeeper team mm -hmm. at the school mm -hmm. site. They had a guy there who was working on grass with weeds in it for insects. Oh, that's and interesting, yeah. The mm -hmm. real problem is trying to get in the turf people to actually yeah. do it. Yeah. Because it's different. It's different. <laughs> yeah. Well, Minnesota actually has some level, you know, the weeds that like will continue to pass through. But 
what we consider to be yeah. Like mm -hmm. some feel is going in the mud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very short blossoming mm -hmm. wave. Mm -hmm. and but some people think of it as an incubation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you have? I was just a comment. I mean, if there's mm -hmm. an opportunity with the local bloom movement mm -hmm. and everything for, yeah. I mean, I know there's movement on, you know, cut flowers to get, kind of go local mm -hmm. instead of having, you know, different weddings that are following an impact. Mm -hmm. So with the millennials, I think that there's just an opportunity that they're all buying houses now. And they seem very so ecologically mm -hmm. minded and sort of sort of different than the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a huge population in the swing. So well, that's where they're going to buy houses now, now. I'm, I'm just kidding. It's, I'm hoping I'm not the fourth member of the Yeah, but they will be. I mean, yeah. Hopefully they'll right. Hopefully. Yeah. And they might be doing things with the yard when they're renting too. Oh, yeah, so. Exactly. so that's a good point. We might have changing cultural values around lawns too. As any other? Did you? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> What's no. the best you've ever heard? <laughs> well, I'm from Texas. <laughs> I'm from Texas. I'll start with that. Um, and there's an anti-littering campaign in Texas that, yes, exactly. It's called, it's called Don't Mess With Texas. And even though it kind of sounds a little bit negative, <laughs> it's really not because it's appealing to this Texas pride, like this cultural value of like Texas is great. And so it's been an incredibly effective anti-littering campaign. Um, and if you ever see stickers on people's cars or whatever that say don't mess with Texas, it's actually an environmental message. And it's been incredibly successful. So I would say being from Texas, that that's the best one that I have heard. They have a whole website too. If you want to look at the campaign, don't just you know search for "Don't Mess with Texas." You can see all the videos of like you know singer songwriters singing about "Don't Mess with Texas" and stuff so like that. Could yeah. Be thought of as a sales job, right? Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I mean, this is like this could be marketing too. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. All yeah. <laughs> exactly. All yeah. yeah. Did you have? A, yeah. 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 So there's some that kind of stick with you too. Like they might. Any other? Did you did you have something earlier? Okay. I, or yeah. No. Well, I was thinking about the aquatic plant mm -hmm. places yeah. in seas where they set up the boat mm -hmm. inspections and how challenging that was. And so that's what I had looked up. Mm -hmm. Just another aquatic invasive species, and the one I thought was now required was like the flag mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. I thought it was ridiculous because, mm -hmm. or how funny it mm -hmm. immediately is bringing in a way like, what a burden. You're required to, to do this. Yeah. Instead of putting us out of this high awareness of the aquatic mm -hmm. species that they're going for. Right. That's a great, that's a great reframing. That's a good example too. Like a instead of a requirement, like an opportunity yeah. to do something. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, that's kind of a related to the don't mess with Texas mm -hmm. idea too. You can you can frame messages that are congruent with, and this is the article, congruent with American values, but congruent with whatever whatever kind of uh, value system that you're working within. Not always, but usually, like whatever the community feels very proud of or strongly about, you can integrate environment, environmental messages into that. Often. <laughs> Again, not always, but often. So keep all of those things in mind for the last part of the class. And now we're going to switch to, and I'm going to bring up some of the things that you've all talked about with lawns and yards. But I want to present some research that we did at the University of Minnesota about yard care choices. And um, the research study was done in Highland Park in St. Paul and then in, also in Lino Lakes. So this is just to give you some more it's just descriptive information about what people are thinking about in terms of their lawns and yards. So this is the study. We called it Yard Stories, Linking Homeowners' Yard Care Choices with Urban Ecosystems. And I did this with um, 
a professor at the University of Minnesota, Kristen Nelson. And the broader project, if you guys are interested in looking at it, is the Twin Cities Household Ecosystem Project, which studies the uh, flows of nutrients in and out of households in the context of the urban ecosystem. And you can find out information about that on the website if you're interested. It might be helpful for what you're doing. So we looked at a couple things. Um, well, I'll say one more thing about the urban ecosystem. So when we say urban ecosystem, what we mean is kind of the interacting social and biophysical systems in an urban area. And we'll get more, talk more about that in a second. So the social aspects and how they interact with the biophysical aspects to influence the urban area and the quality of that. So this is one thing we talked a lot about with people, the lawn. <laughs> you think of a yard, you often think of a lawn. And here's a little comic to, to illustrate that. It says, did you know that suburban white males have over 100 words for lawn? So lawns are really important to a lot of people. They are. But a lot more is going on in a yard than only a lawn. Um, here's, here are some pictures of some other things that might happen. Um, might have you know, native plantings. You might have things that people consider to be weeds. You might have areas for recreation with your neighbors or your family. You have insects that you might want to attract, like butterflies. And then your dogs, that's my dog up there, might want to play in your yard. So there's different uses, and there's different um, creatures, and there are different uh, plants that grow in yards, and different reasons that people might want all of these things. But so what we wanted to find out is, um, you know, what are some of the yard care choices people are making and why, and how might they be influencing the urban ecosystem? But just to step back a second, these are some of the things that we've already talked about. Why do we care about yards in the first place? Because we have these individual, and you guys have mentioned this, individual parcels of land, each yard, which have aggregate effects. So this, you know, these individual parcels together will affect water quality. So there's the Mississippi River in the Twin Cities and the Mini and Minnehaha Creek and other bodies of water. Did you study a particular area? Yeah, we looked at Highland Park and St. Paul and Lionel Lakes and um, and Lionel Lakes and <laughs> just the city. And we had focus groups and surveys within those. So we didn't, of course, talk to the entire population, but uh, samples within those. So um, then. We, we have these people engage in different yard care practices. And these different practices, um, you know, people have different reasons for doing them, and they, have, they might have different effects. There's also, there also might be, as you mentioned, distance between the practice and the consequence of that practice um, on water quality or other aspects of the community. And the way these are connected, so you can think of these as kind of a social, and combined ecological part of the urban area. So we have social, social reasons and individual preferences that influence what kind of yard practices we might engage in. Um, and then connected with that is the physical infrastructure of the city. So together those are going to influence, they're going to form a system. So urban watersheds, as you guys know, are comprised of storm sewers or storm drains that transfer storm water from impervious surfaces to lakes and rivers. And this, these go into the lakes and rivers untreated. So what happens in your yard is then connected to the water uh, body that may or may not be immediately beside you. And I know some watershed districts, I don't know if this one, who coined this term or where this came from, argue that everybody has lakefront property because of the way the city infrastructure connects us all to th in the watershed. Um, one, this, this is just a fun poster I saw from a kid's website, Kids Go Green. Anyways, this is a representation of the difference between where the stormwater goes and where sewage goes. So sewage from your house is treated, the stormwater is, um, there's the storm drain, goes directly into the lake, river, or stream. Um, usually in most cases, and here, definitely untreated. So whatever's going into the storm drain can get, make it into the body of water. And here is an example of that happening in um, St. Paul. So I took this picture. We have 
you know, somebody's watering their, it's a dry day, somebody's watering their lawn, the water is going into the storm drain. The lawn clippings are sitting at the storm drain. There's some trash, there might be some fertilizer, which we can't see. There might be some other things that are gonna find it, their way through the city infrastructure, through the storm sewer system to the body of water and then influence the water quality of that water. The, what we see here happening, the water watering and the lawn clippings are examples of what people are doing with their lawns and they're doing that for certain reasons, for individual preferences, maybe because of social norms or social pressure. So that's the, these are the pieces of the system, of this urban ecosystem concept. Um, so let's see, here's a picture of somebody fertilizing, um, or weed and feed actually. So we often think of fertilizer as one of the, if it gets on, especially if it gets on sidewalks or um, on the street, it can go into, oops, can go into the water system through these storm drains. And it can then um, introduce ex excess nutrients to the water system. And you guys probably have all heard this already, but that can increase um, algae growth and things, other plant life that can harm the aquatic system. But it's not just fertilizer. What about this? This is somebody who isn't really taking care of their lawn, so they're not engaging in mowing or fertilizing. Would this have any effects on the system, and what might they be? Yeah, soil erosion, the volume of water. Imagine a large rainstorm comes through. Some of these soil, soil, soil particles are going to be washed into the storm drains. Um, Phosphorus, which is a nutrient that encourages algae growth or enables algae growth, uh, binds with soil easily, and so that will make its way into the storm drain. So it's not just the high maintenance lawn. It can also be other types of yard care practices. And then also, again, the mowing and things like that, the yard clippings that get into, that introduce excess nutrients to the water body through the storm uh, drain system. And this is a picture of something, you know, that might result from <laughs> those excess nutrients. So what people have tried to do is try to um, bridge the distance between the action and the consequence through some of these kinds of messages. You know, we might want to reframe this, I don't know, but this says, please don't pollute drains to the Mississippi River. So they're trying to show that whatever happens right here is going to get to the river. Here's another one you may have seen before. This is a humor one. <laughs> if you hear, this, is, this message is very much trying to connect the action to the consequence. So if you're going to use excess fertilizer that lands especially on the sidewalks and this, in, in the street where it can easily get washed into the, the storm drain um, and then into the body of water, you might as well just be putting fertilizer right on the lake or the river. Um, so that, that's some background. But now I want to talk specifically about what we found out about how people think about yard, what people do with their yards, and what they think about their yard care choices, and also how they think about their yards as part of an ecosystem. So our study sites, again, are Highland Park in St. Paul and Lino Lakes in, um, Lino Lakes <laughs> in the Twin Cities in the North Metro. Um, and we did both surveys and we had group discussions about yards and lawns. And people love to talk about their <laughs> yards and lawns. It's, it was pretty fun. We did, well, we did a survey first. And anybody who filled out the survey could say they're interested in information exchanges about lawns and yards. And then we contacted those people uh, a few months later to see if they would participate in two discussions over the summer. And then a subset of that, those so people agreed. No, we constructed a representative sample for the survey. So we sent out like, yeah, 2,000 surveys mm -hmm. to each area. So 2,000 Highland Park and 2,000 Lino Lakes. And we got like a 25% response rate, which is not great, but OK, especially considering how long the <laughs> survey was. And then we had about 70 people who participated in the discussions. And they were definitely the people who were most interested. So we have that bias in our focus group. Um, so from the survey, here's some context for you from these two, two places, which are probably, I mean, I can't say really, uh, definitely, but they're somewhat similar at least to some of the, the areas you might be working in. 
you might get different answers. But 99% of the respondents had lawns. 91% did something to manage their lawns, whether it was fertilizing or watering or just mowing, something like that. 78% normally fertilized their lawns. So there's lawn management going on. Um, we also asked respondents about things they know about the lawn management that you might want to know if you're going to manage your lawn in certain ways. 49% of people did not know their grass type, which is problematic if different species of grass, as you mentioned, might need different kinds of nutrients or different levels of watering, different things like that. 73% didn't know the, um, the nutrient ratio in their lawn fertilizer which also could potentially be problematic. 6% though, only 6% did not know the name of the closest water body to their house. So most people are very familiar with the water body, but 60% didn't know the name of their watershed. So this is just providing some background context for the knowledge that people had that participated in our survey. And it also might uh, inform some of your um, projects as you talk with people about water bodies or watersheds, or you think of, of what things to focus on, what people might know or not know. We also asked, here's on some just, again, descriptive information from our survey. Um, we asked what features of, their, of your yard are most important to you. And we asked this on the survey as an open-ended question. So we just said, what features of your yard are most important to you? There was a big blank, and people could write in whatever they wanted. And then we coded all those responses, and this is what we came up with. 49% of people said lawns. And they could have said more than one thing. They didn't. We. They could say as many things as they wanted, but 49% of people said lawns, 27% said trees, 25% said flowers, 11% said shrubs um, or bushes, 8% said vegetable gardens, 7% said patios or decks, and 2% said a pond. And most of those people <laughs> were in Lino Lakes. I don't think any Highland Park people said a pond because they don't have any ponds there. Um, but this gives you a sense of kind of the, the although most, a lot of people, uh, lawn, for lawn, lawn was most important, but it was still just 49%. There's a lot of diversity in what people find important uh, about their yards. Did you give any rank order for which ones are important to them? Or they could just check all? They, could, they just wrote in. Okay. Yeah, so we didn't do a rank order for this one. So whatever they wrote in is what we, we coded for. Um, but when you're, you know, thinking, you're talking about your neighbors, thinking about projects, keep in mind that there's a lot of stuff that people find important, even though lawns might be um, dominant in some way. Um, people still have a lot of other thing, features that are important to them. And then we also ask people to describe their ideal lawn. And again, this was an open-ended question, and they could say, write in whatever they wanted, and then we coded the answers. And these are the, the, the responses that we got. There were others too, but um, these are the major ones. So green was the most written response, about 45% of the people, weed free. But then a lot of people were really interested in low input and low maintenance types of lawn. And this gets to, and I don't know your name, but your point about the uh, grass in California. Tara, the low input, low maintenance kind of grass. So a lot of people are interested in that. Um, and it's growing, so keep that in mind. Some people wanted lawns to be thick, full, or lush, or simply healthy. Then we also asked, what criteria guide your household's vegetation choices? So this was not an open-ended question. This is, we provided little boxes for people to check, but I'll just give you a chance to look at this. Um, the answer that was the most checked was easy to maintain. So that's something that you might want to think about too. And then creates a beautiful yard. So check that out. Why do people do what they do? Okay, and then now, so these are again just these, what, I'm, what I just presented to you is just descriptive data about people's yard choices um, and preferences really. What they're doing and what they prefer about lawns and yards, what's important to them about their own lawn and yard. I wanna to talk to you uh, for a second about a different study and then we'll get back to our study. Ask yeah. That's a good question. What we meant by that <laughs> is that 
it could grow well in whatever yard you had. So if you had a really shady yard, you would choose vegetation that could grow well in shade. If you had really sandy soil, you would choose vegetation that could grow well in sandy soil. Um, it's problematic though, because we don't know what other people thought we meant by <laughs> suited to yard conditions, which is why we asked a bunch of other open-ended questions too, so we could get a better sense. That's a good question. So this is from a different study, um, but I find this absolutely fascinating. And this relates more to how people or why people might choose to do different things with their yard. So I'm not sure, you can see these different pictures. And the study asked um, the study participants, and this was done in Michigan. The study asked the study participants to select which yard um, they most would most prefer to be their own yard. Numbers one through five they could choose from. So they asked them that. So what do you guys think they said? Three. 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 Two. Two. I see a couple. So the study, actually that what they found was that it depends. And the reason it depends is because I didn't tell you all of what they said to the people. They also said your neighborhood looks like one of these. So they would say your neighborhood looks like number, most of the yards in your neighborhood look like number one. Which um, yard do you, would you want? Your neighborhood looks like number three. Which yard would you want? And what they found is that people largely chose the design that was prevalent in their neighborhood. And here's a chart that shows you. And conventional was the, the big lawn, mixed was the kind of mixed vegetation and lawn, and innovative was the native planting. Um, so do you like control they didn't and they should have. <laughs> but still, it's pretty fascinating to see that this, the survey respondents, or the respondents to the study were really grouped around which one they um, thought the neighborhood neighbors' yards were. So if they thought the neighbors' yards were conventional, most people chose the conventional front yard design. If they thought the neighborhood was mixed, it had different kinds of um, yards in it, then they had a mix between the conventional yard design and the native front yard design. And then if they thought it was this innovative yard, most people chose the 75% native garden, yard, garden front yard design. Which is really interesting. So when you're out there talking with neighbors, Social norms are a big part of this. So think about that. Are yeah. you familiar with uh, Michael Holland's Second Nature uh, mm -hmm. chapter where, mm -hmm. where he talks about how the yard aesthetic was developed by Frederick Law and Holmes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The and Central Park design, the, the parkland. Yeah. It's kind of like a continuous part. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why people chose to own their own. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, it's some interesting books on the history of the lawn. That and ex parts of books about the history of lawn that, that you guys might enjoy too. So social norms are a big deal. And we asked our, we just asked for reported norms from our people, our survey respondents. We asked, do you think the neighbors on your street have an expectation or a value for a neighborhood with well-maintained lawns? And what do you think people said? Yes, yeah. yeah, so 83% of people said yes. So this is a big deal too. And then in our discussions, we got um, more deeply into the question of what mean, what does well-maintained mean? And there was a large diversity of ideas about what well-maintained means. So that's also important to note. I wonder if they really meant maintain lawns or maintain properties. Or yeah. Maintain properties. Yeah. So, and overemphasize right. the grass aspect. Right. That's true, that's a good point. In our discussions, we specifically talked about yards, like what does a well-maintained yard mean to you? And we had a lot of a difference in response. And, but people also said that they felt pressure from their, their neighbors to have a well-maintained yard. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Social norms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been. Sometimes, you know, kind of really crazy lines, the house looks like it could probably be changed. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to get your message out when you're in a crazy neighborhood. Yeah. Like, what you got on the back of and there's been some some research uh, that have looked at kind of this question like what what does a well maintained like a nicely manicured lawn what other values about that person do people associate with that person based on their lawn and it's things like hardworking and a good citizen you know upstanding member of the community so they found those kinds good of things system. yeah <laughs> so so that that it, it, often it, research has shown that lawns can be uh, people see it as a reflection of themselves. Um, now some information about some water, water quality concerns, and this is, again, just I have descriptive <laughs> data for you guys to just hear about, I guess. Um, these are some of the water quality concerns that people in Liner Lakes and Highland Park had. Um, and excess nutrients are a, a big concern that people have. And then values of nearby water party, bodies, what do they use them for? Um, and aesthetics for Highland Park was the top one there. And again, they could check as many as they wanted. So this is just more descriptive information for you. So getting to, and that all came from the survey. Now I want to talk a little bit about, not for very much longer, but a little bit about the um, discussions that we had with people. So again, what I mentioned this earlier, what we did is we sent out the survey, and then we asked for at the end of the survey, an invitation for participation to see if people were willing to participate in information exchanges during the summer and early fall about lawn care. And people could say yes, maybe, or no. And then we also asked them um, which lawn care practices they were most interested in learning more about. So this might be interesting for you guys, just this data before they even participated. We asked if they wanted ex to learn about exceptional lawn quality, which we defined as using basic lawn care practices like fertilizing, mowing, and watering more effectively to maintain their desired lawn quality. We asked if they wanted to learn more about low input lawn care, maintaining a healthy lawn with less fertilizer, water, <laughs> mowing, and thyme. And we asked if they wanted to learn about conversion of lawn to other vegetation, where they could convert part or all of their lawn to um, things like, such as native plantings or things like that. So you can see from this chart here what people said. 54% wanted exceptional lawn quality information. 70% of people wanted low input lawn care information. Oh, so you could check multiple. Yeah, you could check multiple ones. So that's a big something for you guys to think about too. Low input lawn care was a very, people were very interested in learning more about that. And then 36% were interested in conversion of lawn. So there's people, a growing number of people I would say that are interested in doing something like that with at least part of their lawn. This is, yeah, it was similar for both of them. So the denominator is only more, because it says they can check multiple ones as long as there's more than one. Yeah, they can, oh, um, okay, they can, they could check multiple ones, and there were 667 participants total, and 70% of all survey respondents um, okay. said they were interested in something. But they could check multiple ones, which is why they don't obviously add up to 100. But six, this is, represents 667. So then what we did is we had people come participate in discussions. Um, and we framed it like this. We wanted them to say, you, we said, whether you choose an exceptional lawn, a low input lawn, or a conversion of lawn, or a combination of types, you can use your understanding of lawn biology, soil systems, and watersheds to maintain your desired yard qualities and improve soil and watershed health. So whatever you choose, there can be practices that you can do to um, improve water quality. So the idea here is that we have these yard choices, and people have their yard preferences, and there's ecosystem health. And often we think about yard preferences and what we do with our yard separately from ecosystem health. And what we wanted to do was try to think about where they intersect. Where can your yard preferences and ecosystem health intersect? So that's a large part of what we talked about. In discussions, and I won't go into a lot more uh, about these discussions, except I want to share a few more pieces of data with you about um, 
the types of yards these participants in the discussion group wanted um, for their own yard and low input and conversion were the kind of the top. They wanted a combination of that. And these are just the discussion participants, the ones willing to come out for a couple hours uh, for a uh, summer evening to talk about lawns and yards. And we also wanted them to identify some problems that they uh, saw with their lawns and yards that were not you know, connecting their yard preferences where the intersection didn't occur between yard preferences and ecosystem health. And so they identified areas of runoff as a, so something, a problem they identified that they could do something about that would still be consistent with their yard preferences and uh, being more careful about what's going on on the slopes of their yard. They identified that as something that they could do that would both be consistent with yard preferences and improve the ecosystem quality. They could be more careful about grass clippings and leaving grass clippings and fertilizer on the pavement. Again, can, that's something that would still connect their yard preferences and ecosystem quality. Repositioning downspouts and um, working on aerating compacted soil so more water can filter in. So these are some of the things that people identified as um, something they could work on while still maintaining their yard preferences and at the same time promoting ecosystem health. So this, again, is just for your information as you're thinking about designing your own projects. Yeah. No, this was all from discussion. So um, I, we <laughs> transcribed <laughs> all the focus group discussions, which takes a very long time, and then coded them all and went through all the, the dominant themes and things like that. So that's what came out of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the average, so this was a learning process too. So we were giving them, we were providing information and then we were asking them to make plans and decisions about their yard. So that's what I mean when I say these are the things that they, once they learned about some of the, the way the system was connected, their yards were connected to water bodies, um, and thinking about their yard preferences, these are some of the things that they saw they could do to connect both at the same time. So those purposes are going to um, say influence behavior? Yeah, but we don't know if it actually did. <laughs> we were looking at, we didn't do a follow-up study. We didn't have any more money, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, yeah, so no follow-up study, unfortunately. Um, then a little bit about social norms that people talked about. Um, they often discussed their yards in these focus group discussions. Um, they described them in, they describe their yard care practices in relation to what their neighbors do. So they would say something like, you know, I, wa I don't ever water my lawn, but my neighbor waters their lawn all the time. So it was like uh, what I do and then a what my neighbor does. Those things were linked in their conversations, which is, again, something you guys can consider. Um, and then the, some of the social norms expressed were a norm to maintain yards and a, main, a norm to control weeds, but what it meant to maintain yards and what a weed was to different people were really different. And I'll say a little bit about the weed idea. So there, apparently there's a hierarchy of weeds. <laughs> Most people consider dandelions to be a weed. Some people <laughs> in our discussions considered Creeping Charlie to be a weed and some people liked it because it was this ground cover that could be in shady areas and things like that. And other people just totally hated it. And then um, there were less people, the, the weed that had the most supporters was clover, which a lot of people didn't consider to be a weed at all. And some people did. So there's also differences in what, you know, main, <laughs> mainstream weeds and hierarchy and then other types of plants that people may or may not consider weeds. How many people were urban? How many people were suburban? Um, so we did two, we did a study in Lino Lakes and also in Highland Park. So to get that urban to suburban gradient. And I don't actually remember if, how many people thought about um, those, those different things as weeds in the different places, but the hierarchy was the same in both places. So dandelions were terrible for almost everybody. <laughs> and then <laughs> Creaming Charlie, both in Highland Park and Lino Lakes was kind of mixed and Clover was, had more supporters in both, in both areas, which I thought was fascinating. Um, 
So a couple more things, and then we'll take a break, and then you'll move on to your own behavior change campaign. So the other thing I wanted to, to talk about a little bit is, and this is, again, all coming from the discussions, from the focus group discussions that we had with residents about their lawns and yards. And we would ask questions. The whole discussions were framed around, you know, what are your expectations for your lawn and yard? What do you, what kind of lawn and yard do you want? Um, what do you do to get that? And then how do you see your yard connected to the surrounding area? How do you see it as part of a system, um, a broader system? For example, connected with the river or water quality. So one question that, um, one thing we were really interested in, and the one reason we were doing this study, was to see how residents understood their yards as part of the urban ecosystem. How did they understand their yards ecologically? And this is what we did with that. So we wanted to look at three key ecosystem concepts. Ecosystem structure, which is the biotic, the living and non-living components. And kind of a colloquial description of that is what is in your yard? What do you have in your yard? And we wanted to see what they kind of thought about ecosystem functions. And these would be processes like cycles or food webs or ecosystem services, stuff like that. And the question um, that we looked for in the discussions is what is happening in the yard? So we looked at what, there was, what processes they were describing. And then the third part was linkages of the ecological and social systems. So how is the yard connected to the rest of the city? And I'll give you a little bit of information about it what they thought for each of these categories. So we didn't ask these questions directly, but um, at least in, in the survey, we asked what features are most important to you. But, and I'll, get, I'll bring that slide up again. But these were just emerging from the conversations. So what is in the yard? And this is, again, that what features of your yard are most important to you slide, which gives us information about what people have in their yard. But I already looked at this slide, so I'm just going to go through it again. But people also talked about what is in the yard as in terms of what they wanted to attract to their yard, what they wanted to make the yard useful for, and what they wanted to keep out of their yard. So what is in your yard? These are the things people wanted birds and butterflies in their yard. They wanted to make it useful for dogs, like I would. This is my dog again. <laughs> um, but they wanted to keep out, definitely keep out, rabbits and moles and voles and other creatures like that. And then there's some things that are missing from here. You know, we don't have insect, or besides butterflies, there aren't insects or microorganisms, soil life. Um, so you can, can think about that. Then in terms of what people see happening in the yard, the major processes that they see are um, competition. Competition was a big theme. Weeds overtaking lawns and pests destroying vegetation, which probably sound familiar to you. And then seasonal change was also something that people saw happening in their yards. So we're, we're doing this to, to see what kinds of processes and cycles people might, might see in their yard and um, kind of attaching future messages to those processes. And then how is the yard connected to the city? The most prominent connection <laughs> across your yard was weeds or weeds, blowing or creeping across yards. So people would talk about seeing the dandelion seeds blowing in the wind from their neighbor's yard, and they would be very upset about it. Uh, they would see Creeping Charlie coming down through neighbor's yards. One person said something like, um, I wish I, I forgot to bring the quote, the direct quote, but she said something like, um, I saw the Creeping Charlie like four houses down, and it got to the the house, you know, two houses away from me. It kept creeping down. And then there was new construct there was some construction of the house right next to me and it stopped it. But I know it's still coming my way. I know it's gonna get here. So <laughs> they saw that those connections. So there's definitely a sense of these of this ecological net connection, at least in terms of weeds blowing across property lines. And then human inputs across watersheds was also very much a theme, like fertilizer and things like that going into watersheds. What people didn't see a connection in at all, and I don't know your name, but you noted this earlier about the yard vegetation, is grass and other vegetation not, were not thought as contributing nutrients to water bodies. 
people didn't talk about that at all, even when they were very adamant that fertilizer and things like that were a problem. So this is something really important for you guys to think about too as you're working on your um, projects. Um, so what were people doing when they were trying to manage interactions and linkages in their yards as they're trying to do something with their yards? Mostly they were trying to keep their yards in a steady state by managing these dynamic biotic and abiot abi abiotic interactions. Um, you know, how, can we, how can our lawn and yard look the same throughout the entire growing season, even though there are different cycles going on throughout that season? Some people, though, not all people thought about it this way. Some people described a very dynamic yard where they would have different native flowers that would bloom at different times of the, the spring and the summer to have <laughs> show the pro kind of progression of seasons and things like that. But that's something to think about. Are yards static? Are they dynamic systems? And how could you think of projects in th those terms? And then people also sought to limit linkages of their yards with the surrounding area by keeping things in or out of their yards. So they wanted to keep weeds out, and they also wanted to actually keep their human inputs in, um, except for vegetation, like uh, lawn clippings and leaves and stuff. They didn't think about that. So that's also important. There wasn't really a concept of like connection of biodiversity or habitat across yards, which is also something that could be really important for a system. And that wasn't that wasn't at all t talked about or discussed. What do you mean by human input? Like fertilizer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So whatever things we add to the yard. Um, so I wanted to share all those, some of those findings with you just as information for you as you're thinking about what you might want to focus on for your projects and kind of a, uh, some more information about what people in this area, how they think about their lawns and yards and what they're doing. Um, do you guys have any questions about this study or thoughts about some of the findings that we talked about? What? Yes, we have two articles about this, one about ecological conceptualizations of the yard and then another one about nature discourses in the yard. So how do people think about nature, the idea of nature in their yards? In their... I actually can't technically do that because <laughs> of copyright reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can, sh I can point you to the journal, but I can't actually give, like, no, no. distribute the PDF, unfortunately, which is frustrating, but um, I can definitely give you guys the links to the journals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the examples that other neighborhoods might want to think about is in the Kirkland neighborhood, we have, we have neighborhood walking permaculture mm -hmm. tours, or we'll, we sometimes mm -hmm. we'll just do a kind of a plain garden tour, but sometimes we'll bring somebody like Chris Lyric or Russ Henry, and he's a kind of a famous gardener who likes to wear a kilt, kind of an eccentric guy who's into composting. And so he'll walk around various yards and then all the things people think are weeds, you know, he'll talk about the, and he'll kind of analyze what the, what the person's soil is like by looking what, what plants are growing. And so, but if you get a group of people and walking like two mm -hmm. different several yards with a knowledgeable person, it can really, generate a lot of awareness because you're in different yards and it also gets people to know each other. So that's a really fun way to do this. Yeah, it's a great idea. Any other thoughts about, or did any of these things findings surprise you or did they seem like what you've experienced when you thought about your own yards and talked with other people about their yards and things like that? Mm -hmm. that yeah. this, and they did a similar set of interviews and, and focus groups and surveys in the Standish Erickson neighborhood in South Minneapolis. And they found the same thing, mm -hmm. slightly different though. They found that in the front yards, people absolutely um, followed the norm, es especially new homeowners. You look down the block, and if everybody has a green lawn and a tree and a couple of bushes, they do a green lawn, a tree, and a couple of bushes, and the social norm in the front yard is so strong. There was there was virtually no deviation from it. In the backyard, every single one is different. So the social mm -hmm. norm holds, you know, the property value, curb 
appeal is very strong in the front yard, but people are personalizing their backyards. Yeah. And other studies have looked at differences between the front and the backyard yeah. too, and they found the same thing, that the, the norms are much stronger in the front than the yeah. back. But so, our, our people didn't really talk about a difference between front and backyard, which is really interesting too. Yeah. I don't know. But their recommendation for us, for mm -hmm. our program, mm -hmm. is if you want to change social norms, put the rain garden in the front yard. Mm -hmm. It was usually like three or four houses in a row that were doing it, or at least on the same block, because it was more normal mm -hmm. on that block to have have mm -hmm. those different norms. Yep. Well, one of the other questions is, like, people don't know, like, what habitat do we need more of? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people are aware of butterflies and pollinators. It's like a huge topic right now. Mm -hmm. um, but are there other things that are endangered that we have to try to like generate habitat for. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah. like maybe there's many, too many bunnies, but. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. I mean, that's a good question considering like what uh, people are willing to have in their yards too. I mean, you wouldn't, people aren't going to welcome large predators in their yards. <laughs> Some, people. Some people would, a lot of people won't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but birds and butterflies are very, you know, they're very welcome and they're, they're beautiful, they're fun, people enjoy watching them and things like that. I don't know about, um, you know, reptiles, <laughs> snakes, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. So it's, it's an interesting question to think about what people, what kinds of biodiversity are welcome in your yard or not welcome in your yard. Um, just along the large predators mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. slant, um, we have coyotes in our mm -hmm. behaviors ignoring them like letting their dog run loose and mm -hmm. somebody actually had their dog um, killed by a mm -hmm. coyote so yeah people have refused to ignore what you know if you get near to a closer in, in your neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, and you even have sound detector explosion and the coyotes are active in the neighborhood right yeah so I think it's interesting how seriously people take this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I, I, I always, like we've talked about, there's not demonizing, but people are different. People like different things. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's good for us to inform mm -hmm. what's not good for the environment, you know, by what you're doing, but maybe you can have it this way and then just not do that and still mm -hmm. have what you mm -hmm. like. I mean, right. some people have a lot of kids, want a big lawn. Exactly. I don't have that, so I don't care. But yeah. That's okay if they want it. Right. So again, that's what we were kind of trying to, to, the discussions were centering around that question, like where is the intersection of what you want and what can also promote ecosystem quality? Where can you, what would you be willing to do yeah, to what get that? Participants get out of this, um, just you help them plan. For they got a free soil test, <laughs> which people were really excited about to see what nutrients were in their soil. So they would know what could grow well there and if they used fertilizer, how much to use more efficiently. Um, and kind of the a general summary comment is there is so there's so much diversity in what people ha want out of their yard, lawns and yards, and there's some common themes as well. I mean, obviously people talk about lawns a lot, but there's a lot more going on, um, and a lot of things that people are interested in that they just haven't had the opportunity to try out or might not know how to try out, like converting lawns to different uses or even parts of it. So, so a lot of people want like a portion of lawn for recreation or to socialize, but they also want maybe some of the lawn to be not lawn anymore in a native garden or something, but they just don't know how to do it. So you guys are, there's a lot of opportunities out there for working with people and um, in ways that can connect their preferences with promotion of water quality. Yeah, I mean, the fact yeah. that people care mm -hmm. so deeply yeah. about their yards mm -hmm. means it's an opportunity to talk to them. 
Yeah, exactly. And people they're already they already care. Yeah, and it's a great way to just have a conversation because at least from what I found in our focus in our group discussions, you know, a lot of people like to talk about. Like we've said, a lot of people like to talk about their yards, whether they want to talk about their lawns or they want to talk about their native flower gardens or something about their yard that often they really like or they're really frustrated with. <laughs> so you can, you know, build the conversations around that. Or the group mm -hmm. that you, you met with mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. um, like if they, you know, people did not know what uh, the ratio of the fertilizer they were using mm -hmm. was, would you having met with you, oh, you might that's why you didn't do a follow up yeah. earlier, I'm just wondering if it affected the future use of fertilizer. Well, they we talked about what they planned to do, okay. and it affected their plan, <laughs> whether they implemented that plan or not. And we we unfortunately do not know. We were in Edina with a bunch of homeowners on Sunday um, in the Edina Morning Side neighborhood. Do you want to maybe share a little bit of what? People were concerned about it. Like one of the big problems is like people are building bigger houses and chopping down trees, and people are really mad about the loss of tree covering. What were some of the other things you heard in your small group with the Adina neighbors? Well, I was in the group we were in, and oh, yeah. the one woman diagrammed her lawn, and it's like there was standing water, and it was they couldn't play. Her kids couldn't play there, and it was smelly. And so mm -hmm. said, oh, this is the first. <laughs> well, she had sandy soil, but yeah. but there there they had done an addition, and the soil got compacted up on top of her sandy soil. Mm -hmm. So then, so then the water was just sitting there and turning into a kind of smelly area. Um, but the people in the diner are also worried about when the streets were re being redone in the city, that the contractors putting in extremely bad soil with like rocks and debris mixed into it, and then sticking sod over the top of it right away. And so, like they're um, they're trying to like have a thing where the contractors cannot put the sod down for a whole day after they put the soil down, so that and that the city can check it. <laughs> they can check it to make sure it's not. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we'll take it. Let's take a break, maybe five <coughs> or so minutes. Um, and then you'll come back and work on a behavior change campaign. First, I want to talk about a model for behavior change that you can use to design a behavior change campaign around a yard care, a specific yard care issue that you select. So this um, model that I want to show you today is called community-based social marketing. So again, it is kind of marketing, <laughs> um, as we talked about previously. And here are the steps to this. So this is if you want to change or promote a behavior. And for you guys, this would be changing or promoting a behavior uh, that has something relation to water quality or storm water runoff. So first, you want to identify a specific ba behavior you want to change or promote. So it doesn't actually have to be necessarily changing a behavior. You could be trying to get people to do something new, too. But there's something different that you want to happen. So you want to identify that. And it should be really specific. So specific is the key here. So instead of saying, I want people to take better care of their yard, <laughs> or I want people to you know, protect water quality, you say, I want people to sweep up lawn clippings from the sidewalk so they don't go into the, the, you know, the system. So a very specific behavior. You identify a specific behavior you want to change or promote. Then you will think about the barriers to that behavior. Identify those, why people might not want to do it. I don't, and some examples might be, I don't know how, I don't know why it's important, I don't have the resources to do it. So identify some barriers, and then I also identify some benefits, why it benefits people to change that behavior or implement the new behavior. So identify a specific behavior, identify barriers and benefits to it, then what you're going to do is design a program. It doesn't have to, a program sounds really big. You're just going <laughs> to think of some simple steps with to overcome the barriers to the selected behavior and to emphasize benefits. 
So you've identified some barriers to it. What are some simple things, uh, just a few ways that you can overcome some of those barriers or that you can emphasize some of those benefits to motivate people to do something? And then this is what you won't be able to do <laughs> yet, pilot the program. But if you were doing a full community-based social marketing campaign, you would pilot the program and then you would evaluate it. But this can be part of your capstone. If I mean, I'm not sure what you'll do for your capstone projects, but this might inform some of the things that you, you think about and do for that. So again, the key here is to identify a specific behavior. It's hard to do this kind of behavior change campaign if it's not a really specific behavior that you can, it's a discrete behavior that people can, uh, um, a tar kind of targeted behavior that you can identify barriers and benefits to and you can give them simple steps to uh, overcome those barriers and to emphasize the benefits. And, and I'm going to give you an example. There's the one, there's two resources that people might want to know about. One of them is mm -hmm. the free online book with, mm -hmm. you know, um, Yes, and that is right there. <laughs> Thank you very much. I forgot to push the button again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's a whole uh, website on community-based social marketing that has resources and information you can check out. All right, so I want to give you an example. of a, This is actually a research study that followed this model. But first, some tools that you can use as you identify barriers and emphasize benefits and design this kind of behavior change campaign. So some other things that you might want to do to encourage behavior change are commitment strategies, like have people sign something and say they're going to do something or verbally say they'll do it. Uh, have prompts to remind people that they're doing these things. Like um, one example might be, you know, sometimes you'll see by light switches, like, you know, remember to turn off the lights. It's just a prompt to remind you to do something. Um, you might use norms in your favor, <laughs> social norms in your, your favor, have skill development, provide some kind of incentive, or explain what the incentive might be that already exists, and provide feedback. One example of feedback is, say, like a water gauge for knowing how much water you put on your lawn. So those are some of the tools that you might consider using as you design this behavior change. And now I'm going to give you an example of watering lawns. So um, this uh, study divided people into two groups. And this was a town in Canada. I forgot what town <laughs> it is right now. Uh, but divided people into two groups. And they were using some of these. Uh, the overall goal of the study was to reduce the amount of water or used to water lawns because the city was going to have to build another like water treatment facility or s and so they wanted to, to, to conserve water instead of having to spend all that money. So they did this. The group one, uh, they tried this out. They visited, p residents were visited by a student employee who talked with residents about efficient water use. Um, like things like when to water, you know, water in the morning, don't water in the middle of the afternoon, afternoon when all the water would evaporate, things like that. So they talked about efficient water use. They were given, these residents were given a water gauge, so again, a feedback tool and a prompt, like to remind them when they should or should not water. And the people also signed a commitment to engage in these practices. There was another group, group two, that only received information about water conservation. They didn't get any of these other commitment, prompt, feedback mechanisms, the water gauge, none of that stuff. They weren't talked to directly by anybody. So what do you think? Who, who increased or decreased water usage, do you think, from this study between these two groups? One, One decreased? Oh, decreased. Decreased, okay. <laughs> so this was actually pretty interesting. Um, results, group one, decrease in lawn watering by 54%. Group two is really interesting though, and I don't know why this is the case, but they actually increased lawn watering by 15%. <laughs> so do you have a thought about that? Well, there was a really cool thing on the radio mm. about this the other day mm -hmm. um, about vaccination, mm -hmm. and there's some really interesting psychology going on whereby if you provide information about vaccination, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of parents will take in that information, but because it's consistent with their 
Opposition to yeah, it, kind of? Yeah. 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 Kind of stuff right. Yeah. yeah. So that might be what's going on here. They hear, oh, yeah. we need to conserve water. Oh, I, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to use more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, I want to show you the, go backwards, the steps to community based social marketing. So, and th the case I just gave you, this, the specific behavior was, to not, again, this is framed negatively, but to, to water your lawn, um, was a surrounding watering your lawn. So they wanted you to water your lawn at certain t times of the day and only the amount that the lawn actually needed. So the prompt was to remind you when to water your lawn and the gauge was to help you understand when the lawn had su been sufficiently watered. Um, they I'm not going over all of the study because it'll take too long, but they also identified, you would identify barriers and benefits to this. You know, maybe people don't understand how to know how much lawn, how much water their lawn needs. Maybe they don't understand why it's important to water um, uh, in the morning versus in the middle of the day. Um, maybe they can only water in the middle of the day because it's the only time they're home. So it could be knowledge barriers, it can be practical barriers, things like that. So identify some barriers and benefits to impl implementing the new behavior. It'll save, in this case, it'll save the city a lot of money and your tax dollars <laughs> if, you <laughs> if you do that. Um, uh, then design a program to overcome the barriers to the selected be behavior and emphasize the benefits. And here they actually piloted the program and evaluated it. But again, you don't have obviously time to do that right now. Um, these are the tools that you can think about using as you do that. Again, commitment strategies, prompts, norms, skill development, incentives, and feedback. Can you give a really good example of prompts? Yeah, so the prompt, again, is um, like, w uh, again, uh, two examples. One is like you might have the uh, sign by a light switch that says, you know, turn off the light when you leave. So it's just something to remind you to do something. Or you might have the uh, something by your water hose, you know, water in the morning or water every other day or something, you know, something like that. So something to remind you about what you're doing. Um, so what I want you all to do for the next, I guess, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll leave about 15 minutes to talk about it, and then you'll have 15 minutes to talk about your capstone projects with Peggy. Um, go through this quickly. I want you to develop your own program. And again, program, I mean just simple steps for behavior change using around a specific yard care behavior that you identify using a community-based social marketing approach. And be sure to select a very specific, a specific behavior that you want to change or promote. That's the key part of this. It's really hard to do if your behavior is too broad. So if you're having trouble thinking of specific steps or barriers, specific barriers and benefits, try to refine the behavior into a more discrete behavior if that makes sense. And I will put the steps back up for you guys. Um, so take, again, yeah, you, can, you can work on it in a group or on your own. It's up totally, it's up to you. If you can tie it in with your capstone project, that would be helpful probably for you, but you don't have to. So it can just be, it could just be an exercise, yeah. So don't worry about it if you don't. Just think of something you might want to change. We're going to talk about capstone projects with Peggy. So about 15 minutes to share ideas. I just kind of, I want to hear from different groups um, about what programs you've developed in this short period of time. <laughs> Who would like to we have a quite a quite a fun one back here. Right. <laughs> you, want, you want to be our <laughs> sure. okay? So um, we our behavior that we want to change is to get people to um, cut their lawns when it gets to be three inches mm -hmm. rather than shorter. And the main barriers that we saw to that are just habit that people have, um, preferences for a shorter, neater lawn, um, maybe worries about like mice or insects getting in there. Um, and then also just knowing how to set your lawn more mm -hmm. to, to get it at three inches. And then the benefits are it's more drought tolerant. Um, it's just a more robust lawn. Um, it soaks up water better. It's softer. Um, 
to be nice and greener, stay greener when it's dry. Um, and the ways that we thought about like how to get this out, like prompts and whatnot would be to have like a decal you can put on your lawnmower to remind you. And also um, like a little cute little um, measuring stick you can have in your lawn so that when it gets to that height, you're like, oh, time to cut it. It would be really cute and very positive. It would have a very positive message to make you feel really good every time you go out. Um, and then we had a couple ideas for like getting these packets out, um, maybe including like a little grass seed sample with it too. Um, but either at like uh, National Night Out, having people out there, or having like a lawnmower sharpening clinic, and then you could actually help people set their lawnmowers when they showed up for that and give them their little info packet to take home. Or walk around um, the first weekend in May when people have to mow mm -hmm. and hand people the stickers, like so, like you would just see everybody who was out there for the first time mm -hmm. and then make sure they set their lawnmower the correct height. I have a question. What about lawn services? How do you, um, I suppose there, you can't do anything about them? I guess you could like go into the services and be like, hey, I'm Rochelle, I'm a master water steward. Well, the homeowners can actually tell their lawn service what they want. So you could have a little flyer that you give people, hey, give this to your lawn service, and then this is telling them what to do. What your preferences. Otherwise, yeah. you'll dump the lawn service. Uh, right. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, those are some good ideas, and if we can incorporate it right how to frame environmental messages to you in a positive way. That'd be great. So, any other questions for this group about their... their well, we were tempted to do a dual-purpose sticker that would say, don't mow into the street and three-inch. Uh, no, but, it's too, okay. one, only one habit. One behavior. <laughs> no lists. Yeah. No lists. No lists. I like the measuring idea. And like the lawn sharpening clinic is a great idea. Yeah. 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 The, the sharp I used to have to take them to the hardware store for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you, you, you can, can do that. that. You can hire my son. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, who'd like to share next? All right, great. We wanted to address um, uh, leaves being raked in the streets mm -hmm. and um, perhaps making awareness for raking the leaves right before the street sweeper comes, so it's actually an appropriate time to um, rake leaves. So barriers, just the simplicity of raking it in the street might be a problem, um, getting bags or um, other ways to put your leaves together for, for pickup might be a problem. Um, we thought perhaps the awareness of that you shouldn't rake your leaves into the street, the storm drain, you know, with the reminder of what watershed you're in could be helpful. Um, and to do, um, Minneapolis gives stickers for yard waste and to buy a container and yeah. use that for yard waste instead. And again, sort of that peer pressure idea, if you see your neighbors have mm -hmm. yard waste bins, you might think, oh, I could do it that way instead of raking it into the street. Um, Minneapolis also does, can do automated phone calls for when you need a snow emergency. <coughs> so they can might be able to do um, automated phone calls to let you know the street sweeper mm -hmm. will be oh. coming the next week. So they give you a heads up to do rake it out to the street then. But it's against the law. Yeah, I don't think mm -hmm. they, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if they can't. Yeah. Yeah. What, what okay. against the law? Oh, wow. Raking leaves into the street. It is? It. Before mm -hmm. the sweet yeah. street sweepers yeah. come? Well, I've heard that you're not. I don't know. I don't know. I was I've heard that this is yeah, fascinating. That was one of our questions. Yeah. That's a really good, I mean, it's like exactly why you would identify different barriers. Okay. Things. Well, then that's even a little more research. Then we know. need more. Yeah. yeah. Then it would be raising awareness. But some cities do actually ask you to do that, and some cities yeah. tell you not to do that. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Is, yeah, would, yeah. that would be a city yeah. 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 by the city. Yeah. 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 But those, those are good ideas. And the, the Minneapolis, like the, the stickers they have that you can put on. A bin to mm -hmm. just put on your curb. It makes you know you don't have to bag leaves anymore. You just put them in a giant right. container. It makes it so much easier. So that would be a great yep, that's mm -hmm. selling point there. there. Well, that doesn't really. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I use containers, and you can't. Makes it you don't get very many. Yeah. You still have to have bags to store the extra ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we thought it was a little bit. <laughs> one of the, one of the incentives so that we would give would be to provide compostable bags right. to collect uh, the yard waste too, if, if they needed it. And 
were then labeled with that. Yeah. Do not put your leaves in the street mm -hmm. so the bags that could be given would be that aware. Keep your streets that. clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is one of the most confusing issues that we face. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really a big issue. It may not seem like it, but the nutrient content in leaves, and especially grass clippings, is one of the biggest contributors to algae in <laughs> urban lakes. Mm -hmm. The phosphorus? biggest. Phosphorus? The phosphorus. Well, is and the policies around it are so confusing. Yeah, these are different for each. They're different for each city. <laughs> Cities have changed their policies, and people don't know it. I mean, and Minneapolis. They have a policy. You call them, and they say, "Oh, okay, bye." I mean, <laughs> really, literally. Yeah, it, this is one of the most confounding mm -hmm. issues that we face. Uh, I would tell you that in my case, I decided I would just pay the cost and get one, and tell all my neighbors they were welcome to fill it up. And I've never gone anything but totally stuck. <laughs> so I'm tempted to get a second one. But, I mean, it's just interesting what a little investment. I decided it's, it's better for the environment if I do that than donate somewhere else. And it's funny, if they don't have to pay for it, your whole neighborhood will use it. Especially if they start to see, oh, somebody else is using great this thing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the whole damn thing's oh, full. And i yeah. got to send my kids in to stomp it down. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thrilled, you know, smiling. And people are, well, she really does. Another interesting idea yeah. um, that's fairly cheap, but you got to have somebody that wants to just do that. Um, the green garbage cans, where they take your your leaves and oh, all your plant life away, the really big one. and they yeah. compost it. Your garbage it's yard waste. Yeah. 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 It's yard waste. Yeah. 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 But you have to pay extra in Minnetonka for that service. Yeah. 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 I'm the only one on my street, so I just say, fill it up. It's got to fill up. All right. So there can also be some neighborhood yeah. Yeah. composting. Yeah. 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 So what about you other ideas? Another group would like to share. Yes, so so here by the way. Do you want to talk about chaos or that? Uh, no, they provide you with bags. Oh, okay. okay. Stopping that. Sign up. Hey, it's happening over there. Here, sorry. Go ahead. And then uh, the barriers were um, social norms, ignorance, time and effort, uh, expense to a certain degree, mm -hmm. the bag and all. Uh, benefits would be uh, setting a good example for your kids mm -hmm. or your neighbors. Minimizing the amount of uh, nutrients getting into uh, standing water. Um, and then, as far as a program or a project, um, having a community event to educate, uh, having prompts with very specific information, stenciling or laminated uh, posters that say uh, where specifically that water is going into, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to it's just going into a standing water, say specifically it's going into this lake mm -hmm. or this pond. Um, and then uh, free yard waste bags, and uh, we even toyed with an idea of a uh, season ending award winning event or something like that. So, you did the best. Neighborhood beauty contest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about like the that. beauty yeah. of the street and, yeah. the, and the great. Yeah. That's a good and, idea. And on a web, neighborhood mm -hmm. website, we have an email that goes out to all the neighbors when something yeah. happens. Can you say those last two? What everybody, uh, there was too much to talk yeah, about. Yeah, it was what? fast. What? The last so after specifically where the water goes, you yeah. had two more ideas besides you have the season event and something before that. Beauty contest. Well, the, beauty contest? the last thing we said was a neighborhood beauty contest. Oh, okay. And that, I don't know, there'd have to be some kind of reward. <laughs> you know, I think tracking with the end of the fall or something. <laughs> yeah. Great, great idea. Oh, anyone else? Another group of things for you guys are about. Arts mirrored exactly yours. Okay. Exactly. I literally, I have a picture so of a skate going in the ground. Oh, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> we also yeah. had an idea to have a public forum where people could report um, their own We also had an idea to have a public forum where people could report, um, well, we first we thought about having them report the amount of money they saved on their water bill, but then we realized it might, might not, because it's summer and it's short and it might not actually 
We didn't know if that would work or not. So then we were thinking maybe they could tell stories about what they did instead of mowing. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. Because people don't want to. Someone else's idea. That's a great idea. More people. So the benefit of saving time. Yeah. So having that public forum to reinforce what you're doing. And then if you tell people those stories or you publish those stories or distribute them with a, on a flyer or mm -hmm. like that, that changes things. It really does. Stories are what people <laughs> respond to. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, okay, so who hasn't seen that idea? We've been talking poop. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's That's a lot of work in the uh, the result of that. That's a good idea, yeah. And that's Picking up, I think dog waste is also strongly is is a good example of a, a changing social norm because in some areas it definitely like there is no way that anybody would leave dog waste on the ground at all. So as that got going, maybe the social norm would develop and then you wouldn't even have to. I, I it wouldn't even be a problem anymore. A lot so of the, and you see that in different mm -hmm. parks you yeah. go to. Some parks there's yeah. none, it's, and it's so everybody picks up. Yeah. In some parks you go, there's a lot. Yeah, wash. So yeah. we also thought we. You know, stick a hundred dollar bill inside one. That could be. So th this we mirrors the treasure hunt. I have to share this story. Uh, I can't remember. It was a northern it was a city in Canada yeah. who was trying to combat littering and mm -hmm. encourage people to throw things in the garbage can. So what they did is they rigged up a sensor so that when you threw something in the garbage can. A bell went off and went ding, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and people would go at, eventually, people were looking for trash to throw away. Not just their trash, but like, oh no, you got to hear this, you got to hear this. And they would pick up other people's trash. So just a little ding, 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 thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Changed everything, because now it was a treat. <laughs> right? Yeah. So in the party. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or you could get a, a treat for your dog every time you throw um, yeah, dog a dog in the But not right now. Mm -hmm. No, but I have had poop go in there. No. I mean, not mine. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. I really like the, the idea of like, the having where they have the bags, having the sign that says, here's like a pic, like it's the map of that body of water. Yeah, like, I love hey, that. this is where it drains to here, because that's something that like I wouldn't even necessarily think of. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I need to clean it up so people don't step on it. Right. But so we're also really going cool. to create a new um, biodegradable spray paint that we can go around and just spray paint those little poop piles. So after they've been picked up, and so that people would start to know that oh. all, oh, so you could cool. see where yeah. it drains yeah. to yeah. maybe. Because it would be degraded and it would create a little oh. trail that would head down to the creek. That's so pretty cool. Yeah. 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 These are some great. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I live on a double dead end, so everybody in the neighborhood has to go by, and I live on the corner, so everybody has to see my house. So I think it'd be really cool to line the road with a rain garden and have people, ever, well, everyone would see it, but everyone would ask questions. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but some barriers that we would have is social norms. I know, like I tried, I, my mom and I want to get backyard chickens and my dad is like, absolutely not, no one else wants chickens in this neighborhood. I mean, that's what we want it, come mm -hmm. on. But um, everyone likes their, their green lawn. Um, that people are out mowing every single week, like on, like at the same hour, every, like every week. So very much on the ball. Um, and then landscape management, just cause like, it would be a big project to have to cover all of that. Yeah, so benefits, like I kind of already said before, the cool thing where about where I live is the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood would see it, but it, there's no way anybody wouldn't see it um, if we were to put rain gardens in lining the road. Um, and then letting people be aware of um, where it drains to, because even though we live on the island, people really don't think of it actually draining into the lake. So I live on a, the highest part of the island, so everything automatically runs off mm -hmm. down to the lake. So, and everyone in Minnetonka loves Lake Minnetonka. So, um, once we start making people aware of those kinds of things, I know they'll make a, they'll make a difference. It'll be tough for a lot of people, but once they're like, oh, they're hurting the lake, everyone, people go boating, people go fishing, like, everyone needs that lake. It's crazy. So. Yeah, so several, that's a good idea. Several of you have mentioned, like, showing the path of the water or showing the path of the nutrients and where it specifically will go. And that's a great way to, to bridge that distance between action and consequence and make it everything more local and directed. Yeah. Where do we find maps of it? Because I've been looking. That's a good question. Do you know? Mm -hmm. I'm working on it. Go to Sean. Depending on which city you're in, there's really amazing maps that Bar Engineering creates. Like for in the Edina, you can look at their map and it, um, and it shows every actual pipe and which direction the water flows and all that. Um, but I'm not exactly sure whether those maps are available for other cities. The, so the actual pipes, um, the maps of the pipes, they so won't give you. It's a Homeland Security That's issue. That's what I was wondering. Oh. Yeah. Um, so huh. I have, um, there's a few neighborhoods in Minneapolis that I've made um, a pipe shed map of. So it's just a color of the area and where specifically um, the water drains if you're in, you know, you can look at your property and say, my house drains to Lake Hiawatha or my house drains to the creek or, um, but so right now I'm working on getting one for the entire watershed, but it's, it's going to take yeah. 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 Let us know so where, where you The sooner you can identify you. where you want to work, the sooner we can get those maps to you. But is that a home, if you do that, are you at risk? No, so, so that, that actually <laughs> just shows an area she that's that draining that into something, so it doesn't show where oh. the actual pipes are, and that's the security but, issue. But I, I think that is such a physical thing, if people could see. Yeah. But we can say, this is your property, this is where it drains. Yeah. We just can't draw the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't connect yeah. the dots. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we should have. I, I, I want to thank Maria.